subtitle of my chapel address is Rest Life. So Mary of Bethany's Repose, Rest Life. And in this year of spirit and story at Biola, I'm gonna begin with a story. One day, I was on Facebook, and I saw a former student of mine and somebody who works at Biola named John knew each other, Aubrey and John. And I asked the former student, how do you know John? And I thought I saw this word come up on Facebook, rest life. And I asked her, what is this rest life and how can I participate in the rest life program at Biola? I was feeling in need of rest. And then she corrected me, no, oops, no, Dr. Duquette. It's Res Life, the residence program. But still, I thought we need more rest life at Biola. Today, I would like to talk about Mary of Bethany as an example of rest life, attentive, focused, even um, scholarly rest life, as she's sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from him as rabbi. So resting does not mean we stop thinking or pause in our scholarly development. This painting by the Dutch painter uh, Jan Vermeer is quite a um, provocative painting for me <clears throat> once we attend to the details. You can see it's Christ in the house of Martha and Mary, and I'd like us to just take some moments to meditate on the painting. If you look at Martha, she's hovering over Jesus. She looks worried, she looks burdened, she looks a little bit tired and also tense. She's attempting to serve him bread, which is very ironic. I think Vermeer has done this on purpose. Jesus tells us, I'm the bread of life. He wants to sustain us and she is trying to feed the bread of life bread. So there's a tension, an ironic tension there. Then look at Mary. She's restful, but attentive, focused. She's looking at Jesus with wonder and love. She's in a posture of thought with her head resting on her hand. She's thinking. Okay, now we will go to the um, scriptural account of Mary and Martha, and I'm just going to read through it, Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, they entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. So as we are here in chapel today, I'd like you to look at your heart, ask yourself, what are you worried about this morning? We all carry worries and burdens with us. And I'm just gonna take a moment of quiet for us to release those worries, just to give them to Jesus, and I will do the same. Okay, also ask yourself, what am I distracted by? Are you distracted by the internet? By your smartphone? If you have a smartphone, maybe put it, put it away. Are you distracted by your assignments that you have due for class? For me, my class that I will teach at 10.30 right after this chapel. So try to let go. Let go of those distractions and for all of us, let's try to sit at the feet of Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, as the worship leader said. 
Okay, I'm gonna move to my next slide. Um, now I'd like to think, for us to think about a woman poet named Felicia Hemmins and a poem that she wrote describing Mary at the feet of Jesus. Some of the material that I will share with you is from this book, edited by Marian Taylor of the University of Toronto. It's called A Handbook of Women Biblical Interpreters, and she includes in that book women poets who've written poems about scripture as an act of biblical exegesis, one of which is Felicia Hemmins. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Felicia Hemmins this morning. Felicia Hemmins was an early 19th century poet who was born in Liverpool in 1793. So born at the end of the 18th century, writing in the early 19th century. She was born to an Anglican mother of mixed German and Italian lineage and to an Irish father. She was taught world literature and biblical narrative from an early age. Her biographer, L.H. Sigourney, writes, her intellectual training within the quiet sanctuary of home and under maternal supervision progressed prosperously. The study of languages aided her development of mind and power of expression. She acquired the rudiments of German and continued in future years to deepen her knowledge of that noble language, which gave to her own productions an added tone of sublimity. Her later poetry contains recurrent images of mothers teaching their children from scripture. In one poem from 1834 to a family Bible, she addresses the Bible personified, writing, my mother's eyes upon thy page divine, each day were bent, her accents grave and mild, breathed out thy lore. Hemmins went on to write a sonnet series called Female Characters of Scripture, and she begins her own survey of biblical women with Miriam, the sister of Moses, who she praises as a songwriter. Miriam led the Israelite women after the triumph of, at the Red Sea with the words, sing ye to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. That's Exodus 15:21. In Felicia Hemmins' poem, The Song of Miriam, she writes, quote, Miriam's voice o'er the sepulchral realm sent on the blast a hymn of jubilee. Within her sonnet on Miriam, Felicia Hemmins calls for a return to what she calls the life springs of God-sourced poetry in her time. She then continues to move chronologically through the Old Testament and New Testament with a focus on key female figures. As Hemmins proceeds through the New Testament, she penned a sonnet titled Mary at the Feet of Christ. So now I'm gonna read you this sonnet. So we're coming back to Mary of Bethany. Mary, meek listener at the Savior's feet, no feverish cares to that divine retreat thy woman's heart of silent worship brought, but a fresh childhood, heavenly truth to meet with love and wonder and submissive thought. Oh, for the holy quiet of thy breast, midst the world's eager tones and footsteps flying, thou whose calm soul was like a wellspring, lying so deep and still in its transparent rest that e'en when noontide burns upon the hills, some one bright, solemn star all its lone mirror fills. So I think this is a good picture of rest life at the feet of Christ. Okay, so Hemmins depicts Mary of Bethany sitting quietly, listening to Christ's teaching. In Hemmins' sonnet, Mary appears as a meek listener at the Savior's feet free from what she calls feverish cares. I think we can all relate to that. And full of silent worship. Given a fresh child, she is reborn into childlike wonder. This receptive attitude brings her quiet and her calm soul is like a well, deep and still in its transparent rest. Rather than busying herself with domestic serving like her sister Martha, Mary of Bethany situates herself in the position of a disciple, of a Christian scholar, learning from Jesus. At this time in history, male disciples 
amongst the Jewish culture would sit at the feet of their rabbi as they gleaned wisdom from him. Jewish women would have not have usually occupied this position as learning was a male preserve. And so Mary's posture of attentive, thoughtful listening furthers the destabilizing possibilities of Christ's upside down kingdom. Felicia Hemans persevered in writing thoughtful verse to the very end of her own life, even composing a Sabbath sonnet one month before she died. On her deathbed, she wrote, I, or she said, I am a tired child, weary and longing to mingle with the pure in heart. I feel as if I were sitting with Mary at the feet of my Redeemer. How can we follow Felicia Hemans today by adopting contemplative practices that draw us into sublime repose and openness to new ideas, maybe new ideas that God has for us? One practice that has centered me spiritually, intellectually, and even physically has been singing songs from Taze, France. Melissa Miles, a senior music major at Biola, who will be heading to New York City this fall to start an MFA in composition, musical composition for theater, will now join me so we can share a Taze song with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The Taze songs are designed for repetitive meditation. So we will sing the song. Oh, oh, she has to go back and get her my music. music. Well, you can, <laughs> Melissa, Melissa. Don't mind you me. You can share it. You can use mine because I know it by heart. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay. So um, these songs are designed for repetitive meditation. So we will sing the song seven, seven times in total. And we would like you to join us whenever you're comfortable. So this is it, this is simple. We'll sing it once together and then feel free to join in. And I hope it brings you some rest and peace. In God alone my soul finds rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest, find its rest and peace. In God alone my soul finds rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest, find its rest and peace. In God alone my soul finds rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest, find its rest and peace. In God alone my soul finds rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest, find its rest and peace. In God alone my soul finds rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest, find its rest and peace. In God alone my soul finds rest 
and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest. Find its rest and peace. In God alone my soul finds rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest. Find its rest and peace. Okay, thank you for joining us. So I was hoping that would bring us into this posture of attentive wonder, the posture that Mary of Bethany has at the feet of Jesus, captured so beautifully by the poet Felicia Hemans. I think this posture of attentive wonder was also adopted by another woman in history, Edith Stein. The German Jewish philosopher Edith Stein cultivated an attentive, peaceful outlook from which to generate Christian thought and writing. As a young woman, she studied phenomenology with the philosopher Edmund Husserl. She was drawn to Husserl's view of reality, whereby the external world we perceive through our senses is not merely a Kantian subjective projection, but a concrete actuality of its own, open to study. Husserl's disciples saw his philosophy as a return back to, quote, the reality of things that led many of them to the truth of Christianity, including Edith Stein. Stein was struck one day by the sight of a woman kneeling to pray in a silent church. And she reflected, quote, this was something totally new to me. I saw someone coming straight from the busy marketplace into this empty church as if she was going to have an intimate conversation. It was something I never forgot. Stein eventually renounced her scholarship, her study of philosophy, seeing it as a vanity, and she became a Carmelite nun. And there's an interesting story. She, she entered the Carmelite convent saying, my scholarship has been about my ego, I want to serve. And she started doing menial labor in the convent, washing the floors, preparing food, serving others like Martha. And then another nun took her aside and said, Sister Edith, you are not gifted. You are actually quite bad at doing these menial tasks. God has called you to be a scholar. And then the nuns made a quiet place of study for her so she could continue reading and writing. Has resonance with the Mary and Martha story. Sadly, Edith Stein died in Auschwitz in a gas chamber in 1942 as a, even, um, as a, as a Jewish convert to Christianity. Then she was canonized in 1998. Stein and her story prompts the question, what is our communal iconic image of the Christian scholar? So if I say to you, the Christian scholar, what do you picture? We may picture, oh, there's my question, what is our communal image? What is our shared icon of the contemplative Christian scholar? We may picture an old, white-haired, wise philosopher like Friedrich Schleiermacher. We may picture J.R.R. Tolkien, a linguist, very intelligent, wise man, as well as a novelist with his pipe. This is kind of icon of wisdom. We may even picture someone from our own context here in Southern California like the philosopher Dallas Willard, whose words and life touched many people here at Biola 
before he passed away. However, I would like to suggest when we think the Christian scholar, we may think of someone like Felicia Hemmons or Edith Stein. Here's a picture of her as a young philosophy student. I'm going to suggest Toni Morrison as Christian scholar. Toni Morrison's name comes from St. Anthony, and she took that name upon her baptism at the age of 12. We may have young, blossoming, Mary of Bethany type Christian scholars amongst us here at Biola, so I'm also going to suggest Monica Hurry when you think of Christian scholar. I'm going to come back to Hemans for a moment, Felicia Hemans, who wrote that poem, the sonnet, Mary at the Feet of Christ. Hemans memoirist, after her death, referred to her poems as, quote, those highly gifted productions which have not only thrown an additional beauty over female nature, but have doubtless advanced in many a meditative bosom, the sacred causes of religion and virtue. And I hope the sonnet can do that for us this morning. To end, I'm going to say a blessing. And this is another Taze song which comes from the words of Teresa of Avila. It's an adaptation of her words. And so, coming from Teresa of Avila, it is in Spanish. I'll do my best. This is my blessing to you. Nada te turbe, nada te espante. Quien a Dios tiene, nada le falta. Nada te turbe, nada te espante. Solo Dios basta. And in the English, nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten, nothing can harm those who belong to God. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten. God alone is enough. You're loved. Go in peace. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.